Thank you so much for joining us. As always, budget season on Beacon Hill is moving into high gear. The economy is in flux. We've got an expensive migrant crisis. Lots to talk about. And we're going to be hearing from the legislative leadership in this segment over the next couple of weeks. But this week, let's get a perspective from the minority party as we talk with Republican State Senator Peter Durant of Spencer, who won a previously Democrat-held seat last fall, and he joins us uh, today. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me, John. Always good to see you. So, Senator, budgets are the ultimate statement of political priorities, of government's priorities. What are the current budget proposals telling us about the majority's priorities? Well, I, I think that the budget priorities that we're seeing are, are a bit misplaced. I, I think on the surface, when the governor says that we have to, um, you, you know, make sure that Massachusetts is affordable, make sure our education is is provided for, I think those sound great, but I don't see that necessarily reflected in the budget itself. Give me an example. Well, what we've seen is some some large increases in in Mass Health in some of those some of those healthcare areas that I think are primarily due to the migrant crisis that's happening right now. In addition, we see that local aid going to cities and towns has started to slip a bit um, from where we used to do uh, we used to take it which was um, every year local aid increased at the amount that the budget would increase by Charlie Baker always made sure that if the budget increased by four percent locally increased by the same amount this year we're seeing that while the governor did that the house paired that back in in the local aid proposal for this year in the House budget is just 1%, which is completely uh, unacceptable. Could that just be a bargaining chip they're putting aside for when they reconcile the budget with the Senate? I don't know if I'd say it's a bargaining chip because this is something that our cities and towns rely on. Right. It's really an important um, a piece of this puzzle. And cities and towns are under tremendous pressure for the same reasons yeah. everybody is yeah. these days, it, right? It, Inflation, it, so forth. It would be something that you wouldn't necessarily want to kind of mess around with. So I would like to see that be a bargaining chip, but I'm just not convinced that it is. And, and I think you're right. Cities and towns are under tremendous pressure right now. One of the things that we've seen the, the governor propose, which I think is, is really misdirected, is to say we're going to allow cities and towns to increase their own taxes um, in, in various ways. We know that there's a, a proposal for a local property transfer tax. And when I hear things like that, um, I, I really think that's just political posturing, which says, I'm not going to increase your taxes, but I'm going to let you go ahead and do it yourself. And I, I think that's the wrong direction for our state. Uh, doesn't that also speak to the desire of a lot of people on Beacon Hill over the course of many years to get out from under the Proposition 2.5 tax cap that allows cities and towns to raise 2.5% more every year, but if they want more than that, they have to go to the voters. Yeah, and I think that's actually exactly what it, they're trying to do. And we've seen various proposals along the way where um, it's been a little bit more blatant. But you're absolutely right. Proposition 2.5 was put in place so that cities and towns uh, have to go and ask the voters if they want their taxes increased at a faster pace. Um, some towns have been successful, others haven't, depends on the year, and I think it's, it, it's worked very well over its lifetime. We've got to take a break, but we did see uh, last fall, or, or excuse me, a couple of years ago now, start to lose track of time here, uh, pretty uh, uh, solid, not a huge landslide, but a pretty solid win for raising uh, the surtax, the so-called millionaire's tax. Uh, is anti-tax sentiment in this state, maybe it is in your district, but more generally in your perception, what it once was? Well, I think that it could be. I mean, you look, whenever you want to shift the blame onto someone else, right, do you, uh, do you believe that those evil people who make more than a millionaire should pay a little bit more in taxes? It's hard to, to get a no on that kind of question. Um, but to me, it's, it's, it's kind of like the proverbial goose that laid the golden egg. And, um, and you know, what we should be prioritizing in the state is making that goose more healthy instead of trying to strangle it and get everything you can real quick. And, and that's what seems with these tax proposals, what's going on. Uh, the uh, chair of Ways and Means indicated the other day that we're running out of money that set aside to help pay to house the migrants who've been coming here. What will happen if the feds don't step in and give us more help? Well, first of all, I don't think we can count on the feds. Uh, the feds have 
uh, allocated another $7 million, I think, or $6 million to give to the state, which is really just a drop in the bucket for us uh, here in Massachusetts. But, you know, the governor has said um, if we run out, which is supposed to happen sometime this month, we're almost, we're almost uh, two-thirds of the way through the month, um, that she has a few other levers to pull. So I don't know how much of a crisis is. I think that's a little bit um, kind of murky at this point. But we are running out of money for this program more money has to be put in and this is a big debate for us here on, on Beacon Hill as you as you just mentioned we we passed the supplemental budget in both the house and the senate which is now in conference committee and it just seems to be tied up right now that um, uh, nobody can come to a solution what if anything do you know about the status of the work permits this has been a big ongoing issue uh, um, many of the migrants make it clear they want to work, they don't want to be living with their families in a shelter, uh, but the feds have been slow to approve those. What, what gives? Yeah, I, I, we are seeing that the fed, federal government is, is not approving those as fast as we like. However, I will say that in instances that I've seen in my district, um, work permits have been authorized. Some of them are going to, to work um, in, in trying to make a, a bit of a living in industries and in, in areas where, you know, traditionally uh, we're having a tough time filling those positions. Okay. Now, um, I will say that, you know, that brings up another problem, and certainly that's the path that we need to go down is that these folks need a job. Um, but at what point then do you start to exit the system? Uh, at what point do you move out of a hotel? And that brings on a whole new set of problems. Where are they going to go? Housing affordability and things of that nature. So you, you're solving one problem, which is what we definitely need to do, but you're actually opening up some other issues that we have to deal with. It's, it's not an easy solution. Now, uh, Senator, you're new to the Senate. But uh, you ser served in the House prior to then for how many terms? I did. I served in the House for 12 years. 12 years. Okay, so you've been around Beacon Hill for a while. Three senators and 15 representatives have announced they're not running for re-election this year. I, I, I didn't crunch all the numbers historically, but that seems like a fairly high number. There's some people who are leaving have been in the House for de in the legislature for decades. Uh, any insight into why? Is it a, a, an unpleasant place to work these days more so than when you got there? Or what's going on? Well, I, I think that we're seeing some people are starting to think about retirement. Some people are thinking about moving on. Um, and others are running for, um, for other right. seats. Uh, so Matt Meritori down on, uh, by the Cape in Plymouth, he's running for a Senate seat. So he vacates his House seat. Right. Um, and so you are seeing some of that. I also think that traditionally for Democrats, uh, leaving on a presidential year is better to retain the seat. Um, it's always been historical that a presidential year is better for Democrats and off years are better for Republicans. So if you're going to leave, if you're thinking about retiring, now would be the time to do it. And so I think you're seeing a lot of that at play as well. Okay, so it's not like D.C. where everyone's at each other's throats. You know, the, I will say that I will say that it's not that way in the in the legislature here in Massachusetts, and that's one of our that's one of our better points here in, yeah. in Massachusetts is that it's a lot more negotiations that take place. We do tend to work better. Uh, that doesn't mean that we always get along, and that doesn't mean that we we agree on things, but we work together much better than what you would see on the on the federal level, and that's always encouraging. Great to get a different perspective on here. Always appreciate yours. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me on, John.